How do you make a wine glass wobble? How can you look awful on television? How can you tell who done it? I defy the laws of gravity. You can't defy gravity, Gareth. It's a proven law of physics. Exactly, End of story. Exactly. Things have always dropped downwards, Gareth, since that first apple dropped out of a tree and hit Isaac Newton on the conch. Well, there is an expression, you can't change the laws of physics. Is there? Yes. In Wales? <laughs> In Wales, yes. But I am going to change the laws of physics with my gravity-defying ring. Look at this. Now, I have a piece of cord here with a gravity-defying ring on it. Now, you can see it's high at one side and low at the other. Yeah. Now, would it be possible, do you think, to make that ring fall upwards? No. No. Absolutely no. No way. Just watch this. Come on, gravity-defying ring, do your thing. Look at that. Is that a magic it's spell? It's falling upwards. Look at that. It's oh, wow. sliding up the cord. Look at that. <gasps> Gareth. That's incredible. How do you do it? It's a cheat, of course. Ew. It's not actually a cord at all. It's a piece of elastic. Oh. Now, I've got uh, a length of this elastic all bunched up in my left hand there, like that. And all I have to do is to pull the elastic tight and then let it slide through my fingers. And as it contracts, it takes the ring with it up that slope. And that's how you can defy the law of gravity. Have a go at yourself. You might just fool your friends. Would you believe that? But you were cheating all along. Of course. Of course. How can cheats never win? I'm actually talking about cheating in running races like the marathon. I've had Fred in training for the how-to marathon you? for three or four months now, Fred. Should we show him what you're made of? I'm like a coiled greyhound. Come on, then, <laughs> sport boy. Can't wait to see this one. Now, in short races like sprints, it's easy to spot cheats. But over a long course, like a marathon, which is 26 miles long, how can you be sure that there's no foul play afoot? Let's see how Fred's getting on, shall we? How are you doing over there, Fred? Ready! Good. On your marks, get set, go! <laughs> Now, back in 1980, the Boston Marathon was actually won by someone who hopped over the barrier near the finish of the race and only ran the last stretch. <sighs> now, to avoid things like this happening, you're usually given one of these, a number which goes on your vest. But what's to stop you from switching numbers with someone else halfway and letting their fresh legs finish the race? But there is another measure to make sure that it doesn't happen. Oh, here comes Fred now. Oh, and here he comes now. Oh, come on, you can do it. I can't believe it. It's a new world record, Fred. That was fantastic. I'll tell you what, he'll love it. It's all down to that Gareth Jones. What a wonderful trainer he was. He got me through the whole thing. Hang Barbara, on a minute. I reckon you're a cheat. Hey? I'm convinced that this is not the same Fred Dynage that started the race. And you've been given away by your shoes. Yeah, but they're exactly the same shoes that Fred's wearing. Ah, come on, where's your accomplice? Oh, that was a hard race, that was. Oh, give it up, Fred, you've been rumbled. What gave us away? Now, look at the shoes closely. They might look identical, but Fred's laces have got one of these tied into them. This is a championship, and it transmits a unique identification signal which is picked up by mats which are placed around the course. So go on, on your way. Oh, never mind, friend. Oh, what we'll a next shame. Oh, so, dear, how can cheats never win? Well, with the help of a championship, they'll never get away with it. Oh, that was a hard race, that was. Yeah, oh, it, it was dirty cheats. <laughs> <laughs> how can you make a wine glass wobble? Stick it on top of a jelly. Well, what I want to do is to make the wine glass wobble within itself. Now, the best way to do that is to put energy into the glass. And the best way to get energy into a glass is with sound. You can get a sound out of a wine glass by putting energy into it with your finger. If you rub your finger around the rim, the glass starts to wobble or vibrate. Now, that vibrates the air around the glass and that produces the sound that you can hear. Now, that sound is clear and pure because it's a precise 
pitch. Now, I'm going to put some energy into my wine glass using this setup here. Now, it's a loudspeaker, a very powerful amplifier, and this device here, which will generate a tone, a clear, pure pitch, and send it to the wine glass. Now, if I put on my safety equipment, like a proper research scientist, this should work. Right, I connect up the device. And if you look carefully, you can see already that wine glass is actually vibrating. It's wobbling. Look, the whole thing is bending. How about that? Did you see what happened there? The glass tried to absorb more energy than it could actually manage, and so it failed. So, how do you wobble a wine glass? Well, with a very precise note played very loudly. That's how. Fantastic, Gareth. OK, how can you tell who done it? Oh, it's that game we were playing earlier, isn't it? Well, Fred, I've worked it out. Yes. It was... Yes. Colonel Mustard? Yes. In the ballroom? Yes. With the candlestick? Wrong. No, it wasn't. It was Miss Scarlet in Miss the drawing Scarlet? room with the dagger. Wrong. No, it wasn't. I can exclusively reveal the murderer was... the drawing room... Uh, in the drawing room... Uh -huh. With the drawing room. Uh, no, Freddie, it doesn't work like that. He's Confused? You, you bet. You are. Let me explain. Since the Middle Ages, one of the most popular poisons has always been arsenic. Nasty, lethal stuff. And it may well have been the cause of the death of the great Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> That's why this is here, is it? Right there. Because in the early 19th century, he was exiled to a small island where he died under mysterious circumstances. <gasps> oh! But after his death, they inspected his hair and they found traces of arsenic in it. Had he been murdered, who done it? And elsewhere, there were similar, unconnected deaths, also quite mysterious, also apparently involving arsenic. Who done it? Well, strange as it may seem, it may well have been the drawing room, or at least the wallpaper in the drawing room. You see, at that time, Vivid green wallpaper was extremely popular. It was called Shields Green after the chemist who invented it. Now, of course, these days, wallpaper is completely safe. But then, in the pigment of this wallpaper, was something called copper arsenide. By itself, quite safe. But if the paper became damp or mouldy, it could give off arsenic vapour. Are you saying that that's what killed Napoleon, then? Yes, I am. Because the wallpaper in Napoleon's drawing room was, in fact, green, and it did contain copper arsenide. So how can you tell who done it? Well, it may well have been the drawing room, in the drawing room, with the drawing room. That's how. How awful. Yes. How can you look awful on TV? Gail, you could never look awful. <laughs> For starters, you could put that jacket on, oh. which is made of a very fine check called dog tooth. My favourite jacket. This last war is 1971. <laughs> that is an awful jacket. You look awful, Fred. It's the lapels, they're too wide. What? It's the wrong cut. It's, it's not just the oh, fashion no. of the jacket that makes him look awful. It's actually the fabric itself. Now, you'll never see an actor or a presenter wearing clothes made of that kind of fabric on TV because it confuses your TV. You see, there's a tiny travelling dot that draws the pictures on your TV screen. And close up, it doesn't have any trouble with that fabric at all because it just draws black, white, black, white and so on. But it's from a distance that it all starts going wrong because the further away it is, the faster the dot has to read the fabric. So it has to go black, white, black, white, black, white and so it gets confused and throws in other colours that aren't really there, like red and blue. Oh, yeah, it's like the pattern's dancing on Fred's shoulders and his jacket there. Yeah, you get that sort of... don't like my jacket, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you get that swirly effect. But it's not the same for all checks. I can show you with this card here. You can see that this big that's check okay. on the end, that's yeah, absolutely that's fine. fine. The tiny check that's just, okay. grey. just fades to grey. It's the in-between checks yes. that really cause the problems, like these you can see They're here, and like the one on the jacket. Again, aren't they? So, there we go. That's, for starters, how you can look awful on TV, but there are other ways. Um, 
For instance, Fred, that's a particularly bad choice of shirt, if you don't mind me saying. It's my best shirt. Hang on, it's all right, Gail. It's yes. just a, a nice, ordinary blue shirt. Well, on any other day, it might be a very nice shirt, but in this context, it's particularly awful, because with a bit of electronic trickery called chroma key, we can remove any of the blue from the picture of Fred that you're seeing at home, and we can replace it with whatever we want. For instance, uh, how about... Um... Oh, now, that's nice. You're looking <laughs> a very fine picture of you, Mr Jones, I must say. <laughs> you look horrible now. <laughs> now, you can't fail to notice that our how-to studio here is completely white, and that's so that we can get this great effect with things that makes them look like they're floating in mid-air. But what it also means is that anything that's even nearly white completely disappears. So, Gareth, if you would like to um, mm -hmm. hold that big white disc in front of Fred's face... Aye. Oh. Freddy <laughs> has disappeared. Well, he has from the neck up anyway. Some would say that's an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> so what you have is just a headless mess. No change there, then. <laughs> <laughs> and in case you were still wondering, that's how you can look awful on TV. No offence, Fred. Without even trying. Yeah, Fred looked awful. But that bloke in his shirt looked great. <laughs> how bouncy are bouncy balls? Well, I've got to say, Gareth, I find these little rubber balls bounce the best. Look at that. Oh, yes, very yeah, bouncy. But I can beat that because I've got an even bigger, so even bouncier rubber ball. Oh, oh yes. Well, I can beat that with using exactly the same balls that you just used. What you do is you stack one ball on top of the other one. Now, if I drop these balls now, they'll fall towards the table. When they hit the table, the little ball will bounce off the big ball and it will leave faster than it arrived. Mm -hmm. So it becomes really bouncy. That's a theory. Let's see if it works. Here we go. Three, two, one. And you caught it. I can't <laughs> believe it. But I can top that because I've got two bouncy balls plus two more. A tennis ball oh. and a basketball. Oh. Are you ready for We're this ready, one? Ready. I'm ready. A one, a two, a three. Uh... Wow! Oh. <laughs> How bouncy are bouncy balls? Well, very, as long as you stack them one on top of each other. And if you're going to do this at home, right, <laughs> beware the china. Should we yes. show them, guys? Yes. All yes. together. Yes. Ready? A two, a, a three. three. Yeah. never came back. Wow. <laughs> now, how can you have a big head? Ask Gareth. Hey, well, at least I've got a bigger <laughs> head than Birkenhead, like you. Look, <laughs> I'm talking about puppets like this skeleton. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Freddy Horror Show. I'll show you how to make a big-headed puppet like me and no bones about it. <laughs> Limbs first, OK. You need some tubes from kitchen rolls. Got one okay, of those? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And join them together using nice, thick, bendy straws. OK. Attach to your body the crisp tube using a paper fastener. Ooh, OK. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, there. getting there. OK, hands and feet, socks and gloves. Right. Stuff with some more kitchen roll. I OK, see. and then slide over the ends right. of your limbs, okay. over the end of your legs That's and your it. arms. OK. OK. So far, so good. Now you're going to need a collar for your neck. Is that what this is? Exactly. And paint the whole thing black. Yeah. You're going to need some garden cane, flower cane from a garden centre. And just attach yep. that to your limbs as well, because that's going to give you the supple movement that I've got. I ah, see. Ah, All right. Okay. Some yep. white pipe cleaners. Those will be your bones, just like my magnificent bones here. And we are ready, Look I think, at that. to perform. Come and join me <laughs> on stage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the West End and the opening night of not one but three big heads. And I'm sorry, it's only a skeleton star. Oh, oh, yeah. Hey, I tell you what, Fred, this is a fantastic theatre. It is lovely. a fantastic theatre, but you don't need to build a theatre like this. Simply a piece of black cloth with a few holes cut in it for your limbs and your head would be sufficient. I tell you what, though, Fred, I think what? you've lost a bit too much oh, weight. Yeah. Oh. Hey, and I've got a bone to pick with you. Oh, oh, oh. Leg. Should we have some music by Boney M? Oh. Did you know that party down the graveyard last night? What happened? It was dead. No! Oh! So that's how you and your friends can all become big heads, and that's 
How for now? Are you ready? One, two, three. Dem boom, dem boom, dem. Dry boom, dem boom. Oh my goodness, that looked a lot. Yeah, it did. They're a crazy bunch, aren't they? Now, where would you put a championship? That's our watch and win question. You should know the answer. I do. If you do too, pick up that phone 0901 07 07 123.